Welcome to Conversations with Germami. This is episode 9. Can feedback from a smart chair really improve your posture? Our guest is Jessica Spear. We live in a sedentary society. If you're a student or an office worker, not only do you sit in the car or on the bus or on the couch at home, you also spend most of your workday in front of a computer. I've spent the last six years writing and programming, and throughout that time I've always had trouble maintaining a good sitting posture. By the end of my undergraduate degree, I was suffering from chronic lower back pain and stiffness in my hands, and I bet many of you have experienced something similar. Poor posture in the workplace is a real problem with real consequences for many people, and it's a problem I want to address in my research. She was a finalist in the 2015 Carleton Three-Minute Thesis Competition. She's a student in the Human Computer Interaction Master's Program at Carleton University, and she's researching the effectiveness of visual feedback on posture when sitting in a smart office chair. So I did my undergrad in um, chemistry and computer science. I started out in chemistry and then added the computer science after a year and ended up with a double major. So that means I spent half my time in both. I didn't specialize in either. Um, why, why did you choose to add on computer science? Uh, um, I took an elective, a computer science elective in my first year and I just really liked it. So I, uh, I liked it so much I just wanted to keep going. And uh, it actually worked out because after I graduated I sort of decided the computer science was more for me than the chemistry. So. How so? Um, I just prefer prefer the programming and work on the computers to work in a lab. And the, uh, the job market's a little better. A lot of the chemistry stuff is moving overseas, or you have to do a PhD to get um, into the research lab. So it's just a little bit easier to stick with the computer stuff. So you made a practical business decision. You're thinking l- long term and... Yeah, that was part of it. I... I I actually got a, a job in a chemistry lab, a contract, after I graduated, but I ended up um, developing a program for them for their testing facility, so I realized if I managed to turn a chemistry job into a computer job, I should probably just stick with the computer stuff. Sure, that, that's where yeah. your passion is. That's yeah. where, so did you, uh, did you sell them the program, or was it part of, what, did you pitch it to them, this program? Tell us about this program. Um, so I, well, actually, I did an internship at this company, BASF. They do, um... Don't they do the videotapes? They use, yeah, yeah that was their yeah, one. I remember their logo, their signage. I remember that. Their one <laughs> consumer product. They do agricultural chemicals. They also do plastics, which is kind of what I worked with. Okay. Foam, like the insulation foam in your walls and the foam in, like, chairs and stuff. Okay. Um, and that was a development lab, so they would have, uh, customers that would come to them and want them to take a product and, and cater it to their needs, whatever yeah. they were. And they, I worked with them in their um, internal testing, quality assurance testing facility. And uh, it was a lot of data entry that seemed unnecessary to me. So mm-hmm. about halfway through the internship, I pitched this idea of this program to my boss. Mm-hmm. And he liked it, and I ran with it. And then after I graduated, uh, I went back to university for a year. And after I graduated, he asked me to come back and update the software for new hardware they'd gotten in for a new operating system. Yeah. So this software, you could, well, I guess what, what I'm asking is, do you, do you own that? that no, you I or? developed it there for them. Oh, so okay. it's their software. It's okay. pretty simple. It's just, it's just um, importing data from text files into an Excel file. It's nothing super complicated. It's okay. just really catered to what the, the files they were generating in their testing facility. So. Do you know if they still use it? Um, I think so. Yeah, last time I, I visited them, they were still they were still using it, as far as I know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So uh, so once you graduated from uh, from your program, so the, you finished your internship. Well, once you graduated from your program, uh, what was your your next uh, what were your next steps? What were you looking at? What, uh... I actually um, well so so the timeline is a little complicated. So I it was a four year program, but I took a year off in between to do the internship as through the school. Right. And then after I graduated, went back to BASF for eight months on the contract. Mm-hmm. And then when the contract was up, I, uh, I went backpacking with a friend for um, a month in South America. And then we came back, I think, for a couple of months. And then we went to Europe for three months. Is that that independent traveler? Yeah, 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 oh, yeah on my okay. LinkedIn. I had no idea how to <laughs> explain that gap in my... 
in I, my job, like, you know, you're, you're doing your resume and you're like, okay, I didn't work for six right. months. You, it's you like, you have, have to explain it, right? You have to justify it. Yeah. Right? So how was that? How was uh, backpacking? It was amazing. Yeah, it was really fun. South America, you said, and then Europe? Yeah, we went to um, Costa Rica and Peru and Ecuador. And then uh, that was about six weeks, I think. And then we went uh, to Europe. My friend had a bunch of um, family in Germany. So we visited in Austria. We visited them. It was a nice, cheap way to travel, to stay with them. And then she went home and I spent two months in uh, in England and Scotland. Cool. By myself. So then, okay, so what was, uh, I guess the question is, what led you to Carleton and to, you're in the HCI program, yeah? Yeah, so I came home from the backpacking and I uh, worked for a while um, with a friend of my dad's, just programming. He built some uh, content management and customer relationship software, web-based software for small companies. Mm-hmm. Um, it was basic programming stuff. And uh, I knew I didn't want to just stick with a programming job, but I also knew that my undergrad hadn't really qualified me for much beyond that. Um, and so I was... I think I was just Googling graduate programs one day and I sort of stumbled on the um, human computer interaction program mm-hmm. at, uh, actually at U of T. Okay. And, uh, and then I Googled around for some more and found the Carleton one. And so I applied to both programs and I got into Carleton. So what, uh, are they similar programs ultimately? Or? I think so. The department at U of T is a little older. It's been around for longer and I think it's a little more formalized. I think they have a PhD program. I'm not sure about that. Uh, Carlton doesn't have an, a PhD program. Mm. Um, it's a more recent program, right? It's, yeah, it's new, fairly yeah, new at, uh, yeah. Carleton. So yeah, so I I, I didn't get into UFT. Um, I got into Carlton, and I actually came to visit Ottawa and found I liked the city even more so than Toronto. So I'm kind of glad I got into Carlton. What, what did you like? What do you like about this? I just I love the the green space. I love the fact that it's got a decent sized population, but it still feels. Like na- small neighborhoods all joined together. Yeah, 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 it's nice. It's a good size. Totally. So, how, uh, how did you find the program? Uh, you're in your last year now. Yeah, yeah. it's the second of two years. Yeah. Right. So, how, how was first year? How would you describe the the? Uh, it was it was fun. It was um, all classes the first year. So uh, I think I took two classes in first term and three classes in the second term, which coming out of undergraduate seemed like very few classes, mm-hmm. but as it turns out, grad classes are a lot more work. Right. So it's actually more than it sounds. Um, yeah, it was it was interesting. The first term was a little slow, but uh, it was all new information for me. The sort of human side of, of computer development and design was something I'd never really learned about in my undergrad, so I found it all really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I really enjoyed the grad classes because they're a lot more discussion based and a lot less lecture so it's a lo- like a lot more engaging more debates more yeah arguments. yeah C- can you can you talk to us about uh the design um the, the human the human side yeah yeah, yeah. elaborate on that what, what as if we don't know right because we don't know so to tell us yeah, educate us on oh goodness so <laughs> yeah so a lot of um what we learn in computer science tends to be very much how to build the programs, you know, programming languages, some of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, but you don't really talk a lot about the people using the software or the hardware. So human computer interaction, it's kind of a nebulous concept. Um, but, uh, it's very much just anything where people and computers, uh, meet and anywhere where they interface or interact. The, the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is a lot of computer science is about the stuff that you never see, like how the operating system in your computer works or all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So the part that you see when you interact with the computer is like the tip of the iceberg and sort of the HCI focus is on that, that part versus all the stuff that you don't see. So Mm -hmm. a lot of people, when I describe human computer interactions, they think that that's all there is to computer science, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. So it's really about designing things to be usable or looking at how people use their computer things. I mean, it's such a broad category. Anything can really fit into it, but... When you went into the program, did you have a particular uh, niche or or focus within this big umbrella uh, of of human computing? Did you have, like, an idea of what... I really didn't. I knew that I liked... So I did I did in some way in that I knew that I liked looking at um, how 
to make things easier to use and and about how um how much how non-intuitive it is to design something that's usable we think it should be easy right mm. that we all use these things so it should be easy to make something that's easy to use and it's really not it's very surprising um and i did a little bit of um volunteer work with uh, seniors and teaching them how to use computers. Cool. People who'd never used a computer before, people who just wanted, you know, to be able to email their grandkids or wanted to use Skype to talk to their families and stuff like that. And um, So you're very patient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess you'd have to be. Yeah, you do. Teaching. But you also sort of see things from a very different perspective. Um, like I, I met a lot of women who could type great because they had used typewriters but they had no idea of how to use a mouse it was a completely foreign concept wow. right whereas to me growing up with computers the mouse is as intuitive as the keyboard right sure. so even trying to explain you would think it was that, it's almost more intuitive mm -hmm. because it's a bit you know like, right it's such it's so such cool. immediate feedback yeah, right yeah. Yeah, yeah but it's not for some people right it's mm. it's very particular perspectives and that really sort of opened my eyes to that 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 everyone's perspective is so unique that you can't assume that you fully understand that other person's perspective and then when you're designing software or something for them to use mm -hmm. that's where you go into trouble you end up in trouble is because you assume that you can imagine how it is for them to use something and then obvi obviously often you're wrong mm -hmm. so now did you do this volunteering before your program uh, but before you got into the program? yeah this was in in london when i was at western oh, okay. yeah cool um now how did you i guess moving on to to the to the posture chair yeah? yes yeah how, tell us the story as how uh, as to how you uh um what's the story behind the, the posture chair tell us well it's it's <laughs> kind of funny because you do come into this program and it depends on your supervisor some have very specific areas of research some are a lot more open so my supervisor was very willing to let me kind of pitch whatever topic I found interesting, which was fantastic, except it meant that I had to figure out what I wanted to do. And, you know, there's a whole world of the options. Sure, freedom. It's very hard to narrow it down. Mm -hmm. um, I started with some completely different topics. Such as? Um, I, was, uh, I was really interested in um, 3D, 3D gestures. Okay. But basically what happened is about halfway through last summer, which was when I had to sort of put this all together the first couple terms you just take classes you don't worry about the thesis work mm -hmm. um about halfway through last summer i was struggling with what i wanted to focus on and the gestures and the papers i was reading they were interesting but they weren't really something i thought i wanted to focus on for a whole year um and i sort of it's a lot of soul searching it's very it's hard because you don't want to get stuck with a topic that you know two months into it you're fed up or that is already been covered so much there's nothing to contribute it's really tricky and i i so are you the type of person that needs to to be passionate or, or yeah or about what you're yeah about i need to i need to care if i sure. don't care it's really hard to motivate me to get get it done mm -hmm. and uh and i mean in a grad program you are self-motivating so if if you're not motivating yourself to get it done it's not gonna happen um and i was driving to toronto to visit my parents and i sort of had decided that I had to figure this out, I had to pick a topic. And I sort of realized in the course of that drive that I wanted to do something that I felt would actually contribute to ordinary people's lives. So the gestures were sort of ruled out then because it's such a sort of new, unusual way of interacting with a computer that nobody, most people don't usually use it, right? Mm -hmm. Versus like two-dimensional gestures, which are the ones you make on a touch screen. Everybody uses those, but the 3D is sort of the next step sure. in the air, and those aren't really somewhere where we can use them yet. So, yeah, I just, I wanted to look at something that would help people, and I came up with a couple of ideas, and one of them was looking at at posture, at sitting posture, and I think possibly that was influenced by all of the time I had spent sitting in front of the computer reading all these papers. Um, yeah. That's a very, you know... Really, really uh, it's a cool idea, but it's it's very specific. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think of posture, and and uh, you know, you're you're tapping into a big audience, right? You're talking about mm -hmm. office workers, students, just about everybody. You know, that, that sits down in front of a computer or, or who just sits. What uh, what's the connection as to 
what's the connection to posture? I think you were just about to, to say that. Yeah, I mean, I have pretty terrible posture, and I've had... Most of us do, Most right? do, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've had some issues, um, mostly in my undergrad, with um, stiffness in my hands and fingers mm -hmm. um, that I think probably trace back to a posture issue because um, I do spend a lot of time typing and things like that. Sure. Um, yeah, and it just it really resonated with me as something that... Um, affected my life, affected the life of a lot of people I knew. Mm -hmm. And once I started to read up on it, it, it was an area of research I thought that was um, not ignored. There's lots of research on it, but that could use more contribution. It wasn't completely covered mm -hmm. in terms of um, the effectiveness of the current systems that people in different uh, academic settings have developed. Basically, a lot of people have built chairs or other systems that can detect posture mm -hmm. to some extent and there wasn't as much about how effective they were did it actually work to change people's posture because mm -hmm. it's great if you can build a chair that can detect it but unless you can do something about it it's not that helpful so once I sort of realized there was somewhere for me to contribute there that's when I got really focused on that as my topic do you uh yourself do you do any uh do you do any yoga or any any of that stuff? Do you go to a chiropractor? Did, did you consult with these people on... on uh... I, uh, I have done yoga, and I've noticed in the past when I, when I do it regularly, it does affect my posture. I think it's a great thing to do. Um, I, I did speak to a friend of mine who's a physiotherapist. We got mm -hmm. together and talked about it for a while. Um, so that's pretty much the extent of the consulting I did with... with experts. I did a lot of reading, but it's, um, it's tough because it's, it's such a nebulous concept that, uh, what is the, 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 the posture in terms of we knowing what a good posture is, is still kind of, uh, we're still kind of figuring it out as a community, like as a scientific community, there's still, there are, there's sort of two groups. There's the people that apply the knowledge, like chiropractors, like physiotherapists or people, ergonomic specialists, mm -hmm. and they have sort of accepted ideas in their community, but the biological research that backs that up is a lot harder to find because the human body is just so complicated and there's so many pieces right. interacting and, and it's such a long-term problem too. It's not like you have bad posture for five minutes and immediately get back pain. It, it's mm -hmm. very much an individual problem that occurs over many years. It's very hard to study from a medical point of view. So the idea of what is good posture and why is that good posture and can we apply it to everyone equally is very... Those questions haven't been very clearly answered yet. So that side of it is so nebulous. I sort of wanted to focus mostly on the technical side like the computer side, because I knew if I dived into that, it would just, it's not my specialty. It would just not be, um, it would sort of muddle the, the research a little bit too much. So, mm. so you're focused pr primarily on, on the technical. Side yeah. Or? Looking at, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at the feedback that I'm giving people when they sit in the chair and whether that actually affects their posture. And I've had to make some sort of very basic assumptions about what a good posture is. Mm -hmm that sort of limits my results a little bit, but it also um, is necessary given the state of knowledge right now. When you say feedback, what would you like to do? So the way the chair works is it has, um, it's just a basic office chair. Okay. It has sensors uh, applied to the surface and on the, on the seat and on the back of the chair. And they, they're basically f pressure sensors. So they just detect where your weight is sitting at any given time. And um, what I do is I get people to sit in what we assume to be an ergonomically good posture based on sort of the current knowledge. And then I record that and then in the, in the software. And then the, as they sit in the chair, the uh, software compares their current posture to that ideal that we've recorded at the beginning. And if it detects that you've deviated from that by a certain amount for a certain amount of time, it um, pops up a window on the screen to tell you to sit up straight, basically, or to tell That's you cool. that your posture has been poor. 
Hmm. So, yeah. How long have you been, uh, sorry, the, 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 the design of, of this chair mm -hmm. with sensors, did you, did you? I didn't invent it, no. I, okay. I based it on other works in, in academic literature that are looking at the same thing. I sort of did a, a review of everything I could find mm -hmm. and picked sort of the ones that seemed to be the most promising and most influential and based it off that. Yeah, with a few adjustments, but, but basically. How many people have you tested on, on this uh, posture chair? Um, I've done... The testing's still ongoing. The, uh, the testing, it's pretty much finished now, I hope. Okay. <laughs> I have to do, to do some analysis and make sure the results are are good enough to be f to have like that have happened of people um i've done 43 studies and uh of about two they're about two hours long well, an hour and a half to two hours and some of those are repeats though so i think it's probably 35 people wow okay. yeah something like that cool you think that's uh, suitable enough overall will you have enough data or what have you it should be it should be um i've had to do a bit of tweaking and retesting just because of some of the just some of the bugs that were being worked out in the in the code so mm -hmm. um so that might make it a little tricky but yeah it should be okay i haven't done all of the analysis yet so we'll right. find out are, are you working on this uh, alone or is this a team uh, project it's just me no i have my supervisor and he's sort of um gives advice and a lot of advice and uh and kind of keeps me focused and, and helps me figure out what I need to do to meet the requirements for the program and, and to get it done. But um, but otherwise, I built the chair, I wrote the software, I run the studies, I write the paper. It's all me. Hmm. Yeah. That's very cool. What what did you write? Uh, what soft, what, what code or whatever did you the to write the software? The code is, uh, it's in C Sharp. It's a Windows Forms application. Okay. So it that makes, you know, me be able to have pop-ups that look sort of like the Windows pop-ups and um, it's, I mean, it's not that long. I mean, the, the chair itself, the sensors are attached to an Arduino, which is a, a microprocessor. It's a okay. little, basically a chip. It's for prototyping. Um, a lot of people who like to build, uh, things that have computer components in them will use Arduinos because it, it's, uh, cheap. Mm. easy way to do it okay. um it's very accessible for a lot of people they're like a hundred bucks like they're not extremely expensive what are they called arduino arduino okay. yeah cool. um yeah so but so it it outputs the sensor data to the computer is basically what it does in my system mm. and then the the computer software in c sharp reads in the the sensor data and analyzes it and decides what to do with it and controls all the interaction with the user were there, how many on average, uh, maybe it's too early to ask, but how many corrections were there in one sitting? You said it was two hours sitting? Yeah, so it's 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 an hour and a half to two hours. It depends um, okay. because I had it, I want people to be able to get up whenever they want, but mm -hmm. I sort of pause if they get up. So it depends on how often they stand up. Um, but the f there's really three sessions of 25 minutes that are actually... Um, recording really mm -hmm. or that matter to the to the results and the first session there's no feedback because I want to get sort of the pure posture how do you normally sit without any feedback mm -hmm. um, so they really have two 25 minute sessions of feedback and it varies incredibly between individuals I've had people who have had um, the maximum number of feedbacks which is once per minute um, yeah, for both sessions. Yeah. Wow. Per and I, one per minute. Yeah, that's the maximum. Wow. And, uh, I mean, obviously I could have changed that. You can set any maximum really mm -hmm. depends on the software, but, um, I've had a couple people who had no, no feedback at all. They sit perfectly the whole time and never get any feedback. How that's that very awesome? rare. Very, very are, 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 rare because these... the system's quite sensitive. Interesting. Uh, was there, uh, are, are these, uh, people that that, that perfect posture when they stand that just based on no they didn't look you couldn't no. tell by looking at someone i think in this case it's people that sit very still so they set the who good the hell <laughs> who does that yeah you know, anyway. well and the interesting thing is i had one person come back and repeat the study okay. and um and the second time she didn't get uh, she got maybe i think five or six total okay. notifications so very low still mm -hmm. but um 
but not zero. So it does it does depend it on matter. your what it, what you're doing on the computer, how sure. focused you are. It depends on what kind of person you are. Do you fidget a lot? Because mm-hmm. it's the system's quite sensitive, and it's hard to get back exactly to an initial posture once you've started to move around. So, mm. um, yeah. So it just it very much depends on the person. It's very interesting. That yeah. is very cool. So I, I saw your video uh, on the uh, three, three three minute thesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. on yeah. YouTube. Yeah. Um, how was that experience? Uh, t- tell us about that experience. Uh, well, three minute thesis is a competition uh, run uh, by a lot of universities in uh, in Canada. It started in Australia, um, and it's basically the idea is to try to present the topic of your thesis in th- in three minutes or less, and you. You can't, you don't get slides, you get one picture, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you get three minutes. If you go over the three minutes, you're disqualified. It's a very strict competition. Um, and last year, one of the other students in this office, who's now graduated, uh, did the three minute thesis and got third place. For, for which uh, subject? Is it? His um, was on exercise games. It was last year. His name is um, Chris Burt, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so he did that, and so I was around when he did that, and I um, and I went and watched him and cheered him on when he he presented, and uh, yeah, so he it was, inspired you. Yeah, he did. It was really interesting to see to see what he did, and I mean, there are cash prizes. I did not win a prize, but uh, that is of course part of the motivation. But um, she loves money. Yeah, well, when you're a grad, when you're a grad student, it's you know it's not that easy to come by, so you'll take what you can get. I bet, yeah. Um, but it was uh, it. I, it struck me as a good opportunity to clarify in my own mind what I was doing and why. Hmm. Because, and it helped when it came to writing, when it came to starting to write, because I had already gone through the process of saying, this is exactly what I'm doing, and this is why it's important. So you're saying that it helped you communicate the key messaging and the overall purpose yeah. of this Product. Yeah, and at the time, I had been really focused on building the chair. Mm-hmm. So when people were asking me about the thesis, I had said, oh, well, I'm building a chair that can detect your posture, which is true, but that wasn't the focus of my research, and I had sort of lost that a little bit in the day-to-day of of developing. Mm-hmm. So the the process of writing the speech and practicing it a lot for this competition helped me realize that I was sort of forgetting a really important aspect of the thesis and it, it made it easier when it came to writing because I had already figured that out. So, mm. um, yeah, you don't get any notes in the competition. You have to memorize it. Um, I've, I've known people that tried to just sort of get up and wing, impro- and wing it, yeah. but the time, three minutes is very short. You find three minutes? Very short. short. Yeah, there's a lot of information to communicate sure. in a very short amount of time. Did you did you try to communicate to a particular audience, or did you uh, demographic or, or audience, or did you try to? Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be for a it down a it, non-technical, right, not right. part of your department audience, right? You mm-hmm. have to be able to explain it to people that might be in a, a social science or sure. a right or or yeah, anything, yeah. right? Or they could be in the same program, but they you know might be doing something totally different anyway. So. Mm-hmm. The idea of the three minute thesis is that anyone can watch the video and understand what you're doing, mm-hmm. um, and it is it is tricky as a, an academic to learn to do that, to learn to communicate things in a way that doesn't use a whole bunch of jargon or concepts that you think are obvious because you use them all the time, but most people never talk about. So it's very the process of doing that is very interesting and very difficult sometimes, but it, it pays off because it makes it so much easier to communicate with people. Do you enjoy that aspect of, uh, of, of pitching an idea um, and, and, uh, or a project? Do you, do you enjoy that? Um, not so much the pitching because you have to really believe what you're doing is, is amazing and great and should be done and that's hard to, that confidence I find difficult to find at the beginning of a project. It's only when I'm in the middle of it that I really see the value. Um, the but aha I, moment? Yeah, or, yeah, or just... But you, you've pitched before, right? It, by you, that company. You're yeah, yeah, at, so you, it's you true. A... It's true. But it is. It was. It wasn't easy. And in that, at where I worked, it helped. I had a really supportive boss, so I knew I could trust him to come to. Mm-hmm. And I could. I was willing for that one to fail. You know, it was mm-hmm. just an idea. Um, so I think that helps. But I do like the process of clarifying things for a non-technical audience. I do enjoy that. I think that's 
really important. I think it's a skill we don't get to practice a lot. And I think it's... That's a, that's a big market. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, even just from a communications uh, point of view, that's you can consult on that alone. Yeah, for, that's true. I do. I have a friend who, that's what she did her, her education in, and that's what she works in, is, mm-hmm. is communicating, is technical writing. It's communicating something technical to a non-technical audience, mm-hmm. basically. So mm-hmm. it's really interesting, and it's really... Some, another skill that people think is easy and intuitive and really isn't because you lose communicating, but even communicating, persuading, selling. Yeah. Or just learning how to talk to someone who's not in your field without confusing them or making them feel stupid right, <laughs> because right. it's so easy to use. Every, every community does this. Every field does this. We all come up with words that nobody else uses mm-hmm. or terms or jargon. And it can be very intimidating to come into that and have no idea what anyone is saying. Sure. And a lot of people aren't aware that they're doing it. So it's very interesting to try to mitigate that. It's very tricky sometimes because hmm. you just don't realize it. What happens, uh, now, I mean, in, in, okay, so you have this, 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 uh, posture chair. Mm-hmm. Have you been, uh, pitching and, and communicating to potential investors or, 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 or companies or what, what, uh, what are your next steps? I'm, I'm, I'm asking in regards to, um, I'm so focused right now on just graduating. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. Yeah. It's, are, are, are you thinking, uh, after you graduate, is this a project? that you plan on, on refining and, hmm. and pitching to, to potential. I mean, dude, it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a chair, but it's uh, where I work. We all sit in chairs, yeah. Whatever, you know, anyone who's whatever in a professional environment, non-professional environment, it's, it's a very uh, fundamental, I mean, it's a big market. Right? Yeah. Like, there is actually a company in the Netherlands, I believe that, mm-hmm. ju- that does manufacture a chair that claims to do what this chair does. Mm-hmm. Um, again, and there has been some research done with that particular chair to see the effectiveness of it. Limited research. Um, I don't expect to continue with the project after I graduate. Um, mostly just because I'm not really in the position, I think, to do that right now. But, Mm. um, but I certainly would like to carry on some of the, the, the stuff that I've learned and the, the skills that I've learned. And, and I, I do want to work, you know, with a company that makes products that, or services or whatever that do target something similar that look at just help improving people's everyday lives mm-hmm. in a way that's sort of substantive and not just, you know, how do you entertain people more in a way that really, that drives at things that really, deteriorate from our quality of life mm-hmm. um so i do want to do that but whether or not it includes the actual posture chair i i don't have any specific plans for that so cool yeah how uh how, how's your is that your your thesis there yes yeah wow. it's uh 77 pages now jesus christ wow i mean that is double double space so. wow. Wow. <laughs> and lots of pictures it's um how are you feeling about it pretty good it's the deadline's coming up pretty quickly. I basically have to have it finished by the end of July. Okay. Beginning of August. Um, in order to give the defense committee enough time to read it before you defend, because you have to defend by the end of the summer. How big is the committee that are... Or... It's three people, I think. Yeah, it's three professors. Um, you know what you should do? Three or four. Tell them to stand up. <laughs> and not sit in the chair and... No, just joking. Yeah. Well, actually, one of the other uh, students in this, uh, with the same supervisor, she's mm-hmm. doing work on um, looking at sitting instead of posture, uh, looking at how you can get people to take breaks from sitting, because that's another big thing, is um, sitting for too long. There is actually a lot of evidence coming out just now about how um, bad long periods of sitting is for your health, right? Mm-hmm. Um and actually, the tie is probably more, the st- there's a stronger tie between long periods of sitting and poor health than there is necessarily between poor posture and back pain. The evidence is um, even stronger for that than there is for posture. Posture's, I think, just too hard to study, um, whereas sitting is such a discrete uh, concept. Mm-hmm. Like, 
either you're sitting or you're not, and it's very easy to measure how long you're sitting for with a little bit of effort. And uh, so that's a lot easier, I think, to study in terms of the biological side of it. But um, yeah, so she's looking at that. So it is very funny because you do end up reading a lot of papers about how bad sitting is for you, but you're reading the papers while you're sitting. So it's very, it plays with your mind a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's ironic. Yeah. I saw one picture, I'm sure you've seen this online, where it's a picture of, uh, I guess, a caveman. Oh. You, know, you, know, you, know, you know the picture? Of that? Yeah, so it goes like, caveman to, yeah, yeah and then you slouch at the end yeah, over the desk. Yeah, yeah I've seen that and one. You see that, and, and it's, it's frightening, you know, because posture is so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is very... So important. It's, uh, it is, and it's very easy to train your body into a position that you don't want it to be in, right? Anything repetitive, mm -hmm. right, really affects our bodies. And, and sitting in a chair for a long period of time is, even if it's not a movement, it's a repetitive posture, it's mm -hmm. a repetitive position. So it does, it really affects you over time. Did you do any reading on like energy, uh, energy healing uh, from the energy healing community? Like where they look at, excuse me, the bad posture and how it blocks certain mm -hmm. energy sources in in the body like no that. i haven't heard of anything about no. that no no like i've had to community. i've had to stick pretty closely to academics Fair enough. for the committee i don't think they would have they wouldn't have uh, it probably wouldn't have flown with the with with the thesis committee but mm. um in terms of like posture and states of mind yeah like someone is sad there, right there are traditionally you should you know what i mean like there are studies about um about yeah. posture or expression and and the feedback to emotion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I haven't read a lot of them because it's not entirely relevant for what I'm doing, but I have, it is definitely the idea that, um, that there's a feedback loop between your, your physical, uh, posture or facial expressions or whatever, your physical representation of your emotions mm -hmm. and your actual emotions that they f affect each other. That's a very strongly, supported by by academic studies and the mm. idea of you know walking taller to feel more confident yeah, or yeah, smiling yeah. to feel happier oh yeah that's all absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely supported so it's it's very interesting mm -hmm. yeah um and it makes you wonder what being hunched over at a computer is doing to oh, our yeah, emotional states yeah. but thank you very much for uh for for speaking to us, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful. Uh, what day is it today? Monday? Uh, no, it feels like a Monday. It does feel like a Monday. It's a it's Thursday, though. Thursday, yeah, it's, it's a Thursday. It's sunny, and, and you're here. I can see you're working on on your thesis, and, and best of luck with Thank that. Thank you. I think you have a, a cool uh, project, and, and yeah, thanks. Your chair, and uh, uh, yeah. yeah, all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Gurmami. For more information, visit garmami.com. That's G A R M A M I E dot com. G A R M A M I E dot com.